morning or good afternoon, but anyway, I'd like to welcome you here. I'm James Mason, Dean of the College of Fine Arts and Communications. This is a very impressive group, and we are very pleased to have you here with us. Since the Department of Design from our college is housed in the George H. Brimhaw Building, I have the honor to conduct this historic historical activity where we can again recognize one of the, gr the great presidents of Brigham Young University. This is also the selected day for the opening of the George H. Brim Hall Gallery. Throughout the coming years, this gallery will attract many students and visitors to the Brim Hall building to see numerous exhibits and displays. Thank you for your contributions that have made this a reality. We will begin our meeting by calling upon Brother Thomas B. McKay to offer our invocation. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful to be here. We are grateful for the gospel of thy son, Jesus Christ. We are grateful that families are forever. We are grateful that we have the opportunity of getting together as family members and friends, many of whom we have not seen for many, many years, and of renewing our acquaintances. We are grateful for George H. Brimhall, a great educator, a great teacher. We thank thee for the good that he wrought here upon the Brigham Young University campus and for the thousands of lives that he touched for good. We are grateful that he was a good father and a terrific grandfather. Now we ask thee to let thy spirit be with us during the proceedings of this day that all might go well. We are so thankful those, for those who have spent hours and hours and hours and so much of their time and energy and effort in preparing this. Let thy special blessings be with them. We are grateful for the food that has been prepared for our use and for those who have prepared it. And we ask thy blessing upon it in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Brother McKay. Before we begin our luncheon, I would like to introduce a few individuals and provide a quick overview of the afternoon activities. But first of all, will you join me in expressing appreciation to Sherilyn Heath for providing the background music. Sherilyn is a junior majoring in piano performance from Provo. Among all of you descendants of George H. Brimhall, we have G. H. Brimhall with us, who is the only living child of President Brimhall. Will you please stand? Thank you. Raymond Holbrook, the oldest grandchild, was planning to attend, but is ill this morning. We also have the university president and his counsel with us, President Jeffrey R. Holland. <laughs> J. R. Balaf, academic vice president and provost. John B. Stolton, executive vice president. Ronald G. Hyde, Assistant to the President of University Relations. Uh, D. Anderson, Vice President, uh, Administrative Vice President, excuse me. 
in Eugene H. Bramhall, Assistant to the President, General Counsel. The flag that is being displayed behind me is the flag that was flown in front of President Brimhall's home from 1895 throughout the remainder of his life. We appreciate uh, uh, Golden for bringing this and taking such good care of it. We'll, this is a, a treasure that we'll be interested in displaying and using on various occasions here at the university. Following our luncheon, we will have a special program. Everyone is then invited to meet in the garden court of this building for a family portrait. This location is a correction to the printed program. Will you please complete the information card that you were given as you entered today and bring that to the photography se session? We'll have ushers there to direct you in finding the proper location. After this activity, we would like to invite everyone to the Brimhaw building to see the addition to the building, as well as the results of the refurbishing in our newly acquired gallery. Brother John W. Seifert, Chairman of the Department of Design, and his students will guide us on a tour of the building. There will be vans outside to transport those who would like to ride to the Brimhaw building. As you tour this landmark building, you will have a chance to read some of the statements of President Brimhall and see the memorial area in the gallery that will help keep his thoughts alive among our students. You may be interested in just one bit of trivia. The area in the building that was originally used for a shop for auto mechanics is now being used for designing automobiles for the future. This has been a joint venture with the Ford Motor Company and, and General Motors Corporation. Now may I invite all of you to enjoy your lunch. Thank you. In your souvenir program, you will see an insert that lists the program, the, the activities for the remainder of the day. We'll be privileged to have a musical treat. And the text for all of these songs that we are going to hear were written by President Brimhall. The Song of the Tithe Pair will be performed by your preschool children and grandchildren. After their performance, we will excuse them to go back to their room for their own activities. The other two numbers will be performed by some of the more than 50 descendants who are currently enrolled at BYU. There was one omission on the program, and that was a trio that will, right after we hear from President Holland, we will have uh, the trio perform. And uh, that will be performed by Margaret Blair Young, Elizabeth Groberg Stratton, and Cindy Berry. They uh, will have them announce that number. I don't have it here on the notes. No. So we'll now hear from our children. If Jerry, if they're ready, just bring them right on. Over 60 years ago, President Brimhall wrote a letter to Rudger Clausen, President of the Council of the Twelve, in which he said, Dear President Clausen, Replying to your letter containing an appointment to deliver a gospel talk over Radio KSL, Sunday, December 18th at 9 p.m., I appreciate the appointment as an honor and will do my best to fill it. I am enclosing a little sermon, in a sense, and I would like your judgment on the composition as to whether the word earn should be substituted by the word gain. The composition, as it is, reflects my interpretation of the law of tithing, but I find that others do not concur, insisting that it is our gains rather than our earnings on which the Lord requires a tenth. 
Then President Brimhall encloses a seven-verse lyric he calls Song of the Tithe Pair, which he quoted in his address over KSL on December 18, 1927. Note, he is using gain, not earn. Some of his great-great-great-grandchildren will now sing four verses of this song, beginning with, Not mine to keep, not mine to spend, not mine to give, not mine to lend. Tis the Lord's part, tis the Lord's part, a tenth of all I gain. Most of us are just great-great-grandchildren of George H. Brimhall. Here is an interesting account in his own handwriting on BYU stationery of when President Brimhall wrote the song Old Glory during World War I. He writes, I went out to go downtown. Car refused to start. I tried. Clark tried. Then expert auto student tried, cranked, and peaked, and fumbled. No go. I looked in gas tank. Darkness. <laughs> Put stick down. Dry. <laughs> Telephoned to Wells with whom I was going to dinner. He is on way with fuel. I penned this song. After the group sings the song, we invite the audience to join with us 
in a repeat of the chorus, which you'll find in the back of your program.
Thank you. Those were delightful numbers. Our first speaker this afternoon is one of 11 children of brother and sister Delbert Groberg. I was impressed to learn that their seven sons and one of their daughters all served full-time missions and that three of their sons have served as mission presidents. Their oldest son and our speaker today is a member of the first quorum of the 70 and is presently serving as a member of the area presidency in Buenos Aires, Argentina. We are very pleased to hear from Elder Groberg at this time. My wife and I have timed this talk over and over again, and uh, they said between 15 and 20 minutes, so we compromised at 17 and a half, but the last time it was 18, and with these few remarks, it's going to be 19, so when 20 is up, you can all leave. Just thought you'd like to know what you're in for. We are here to honor a great and good man, George Henry Brimhall. The long and impressive list of President Brimhall's achievement as teacher, administrator, poet, testifier, father, and so forth, is far more than we will take time to recite today. President Brimhall was a humble man, and as the Savior, who when one called him good master, replied, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. So President Brimhall would likely respond when called a great man, No man is great, only God, but the Lord uses humble men to do great things. The Lord used George H. Brimhall to accomplish many great things. The Lord is always willing, even anxious, to use any and all of us to do many good, even great things, if we are willing. Willing to bend to his will and to do his bidding, regardless of the sacrifice required. Listen to the Lord's set of requirements and his great promise if we meet those requirements. Quoting from the 97th section of the Doctrine. Verily I say unto you, all among you who know your hearts are honest and are broken and your spirits contrite and are willing to observe your covenants by sacrifice, yea, every sacrifice which I, the Lord, shall command, you are accepted of me. For I, the Lord, will cause you to bring forth as a very fruitful tree which is planted in a goodly land by a pure stream that yieldeth much precious fruit. I submit to you today that George H. Brimhall met these requirements. He was humble. He was willing to sacrifice. And thus the Lord used him to accomplish many good, yes, even many great things. I want to focus on just three among many great things in which President Brimhall was an instrument in the Lord's hand. First, the continued existence and growth of Brigham Young University. Second, the continued existence and growth of a large and faithful posterity. Third, the continued existence and growth, at least in terms of internalized teachings, of a great body of inspired works. To me, these show beyond doubt that the Lord did indeed cause him to bring forth as a very fruitful tree that yieldeth much precious fruit. Going in that order then, first, the continued existence and growth of Brigham Young University. As we look at the extensive grounds and buildings on this campus and sense the solid feel of the various schools and stakes and student body and faculty and even the football and basketball team at times, it seems hard to imagine how many tenuous threads the continued existence of this institution has hung on. At various times and in various ways, the Lord has used different people to preserve this university to continue its movement towards its full potential. One of these men was George H. Brimhall. He loved BYU. He had a vision of its future greatness. He willingly sacrificed to qualify to be able to do his part under the direction of God so that this university could continue its marvelous progress towards its divine end. Let me give you some examples as to sacrifice. Quote from President Brimhall, I left my position as county superintendent at schools at $40 a month and came to BYU at $20 a month. Often, then he puts in parentheses, often given in script and usually discounted by 10% or more at the local stores. (laughs) For some years, he was acting president. Then his health failed him, and he went to California and then to Canada to try to regain his health. 
in Canada, his son wrote, Late in the year 1903, while my father was still ill, I was riding one day in a buggy, and Pa was reading his mail. He handed me one letter to read and said, See what you think of this. It read as follows. Brother George H. Brimhall, The Board of Trustees of the Church Board of Education have selected you to be the president of Brigham Young Academy. May we have your answer soon. Signed, President Joseph F. Smith. In a few days, he was on his way to Utah to preside over the BYU, even though he was not in good health. He had great visions of the school. He was humble. Again, quoting from some of his writings, If the Lord makes a success of this school with me at the head of it, he will have to have a case of doing much with little. He will have to take the weak things of the earth and make it mighty in his hand. But if I can have his spirit, there will be nothing fail. But I could not succeed here without his spirit. This is God's school. I hope I shall not forget it in the morning or at night or at any time. He had great faith in the purposes of the school. He once told a friend, This school depends not on any man or any set of men. God planted it, and we are but gardeners to take care of it. He had deep feelings about the importance of a good education. Quote, I could stand to lose my own home, go out and live in a tent, better than I could stand to see the youth of Israel meet when they come here, close doors, or a poor bill of fare. It cannot be. Surely this school is an institution of destiny. They had many financial problems then, as they do now, and he said, when a very critical time came, speaking to the faculty and students, I realize the problems we have, but I want to assure you there is a mastermind, my friends, a mastermind, and he will intercede on our behalf. He can move the minds of men and the minds of women, move the wheels of finance, and open the purses of the earth so that we will have all we need, perhaps not all we want, but all we need. I want to proclaim in your presence that some of you here will live to see this school proclaimed to be one of the great schools of the earth. This in 1906. He was very determined that the school maintain its integrity. Brigham Young University and the University of Utah have been school rivals ever since most of most Utahns can remember. The history of this rivalry started almost the very day BYU was formed. Trying to keep BYU, Brigham Young Academy from merging into the state university system was a great concern of President Brimhall, and it was largely his strong will and determination and faith that kept it from happening. He had strong feelings about religious education at BYU. He said, the job of the religious education department here as a unit is to crystallize all that is given elsewhere, to turn the stream of knowledge accruing in all the other classes into the pulsating living flood of human interest that some style the humanitarian movement, but which we call vitalized religion. It was a very touchy issue because some of the very high church officials favored the merger, feeling that the church would gain more influence if we were involved more directly in the state system. There was a large meeting with the Board of Trustees, and after much intense discussion, Brimhall, President Brimhall stated at, at his, as his concluding statement to the board, quote, My experience leads me to say that we might get hold of the university system as a church and, as, and with our morals, but we would not be able to keep hold of it. He feared moral standards may initially prevail if the school did merge, but ultimately would be lost in secularized religion. And we can, of course, see what has happened in some state universities. He writes in his journal, when the meeting ended, he's under the title, Big Decision. Meeting of the Board of Education at, pre at the president of the church's office. Big discussion. Saved the college department of Brigham Young Academy. The university tried to cut it out of existence, but the Lord preserved it. 
Then he says, I did not create this university, speaking to the faculty. You did not create it. I have not maintained it. You have not maintained it. I am an employee. I wish to declare to you that no one, either guest or outsider, shall stop the progress and growth of this school. Yes, the Lord is behind Brigham Young University and is causing it to bring forth much precious fruit. And, of course, the end is not yet. We pay tribute to Grandpa Grimhall for his part. Second evidence, if you want to call, of the Lord using him, the continued existence and growth of a large posterity, generally faithful and true to the ideals of the gospel he espoused. I have not attempted to get an exact count. We understand that there are close to 14 or 1,500 descendants of President Brim Hall at the present time. But the facts are that large numbers of his posterity are faithful, have served missions for the church. Large numbers have attended and taught or teach at BYU and elsewhere. Large numbers have served as bishops, stake presidents, Relief Society presidents, teachers and auxiliaries. And in fact, some have served in every position from deacon to general authority. Among his posterity have been successful businessmen, respected community leaders, trusted educators, youth leaders, scientists, and dedicated family men and women of deep devotion and faith. Yes, we cannot doubt that I, the Lord, caused him to bring forth as a very fruitful tree which is planted in a goodly land by a pure stream that yieldeth much precious fruit. I recognize that there are many families involved, and I will, since I'm familiar with my own, just trace that. He had a daughter named Alcine Elizabeth Brimhall. What a woman of faith and courage. She married Lafayette Hinckley Holbrook. They had 11 children, all of whom attended Brigham Young University. One of those 11 was my mother, Jenny Holbrook. Again, to me, a great woman of faith and courage. She married Delbert V. Groberg, and they also had 11 children, all of whom attended and graduated from Brigham Young University. I feel fortunate to be one of those 11, and the generations continue, as the Lord has blessed me and my wife with 11 children also, all of whom, that is, who are old enough, have attended Brigham Young University. We assume this will continue with grandchildren and so forth in an ever-widening circle as God causes the tree to bring forth much precious fruit. There are many other families with similar situations, and as been said before, the end is not yet. I wish to pay tribute to my mother and to my grandmother. They have collected and preserved and prepared Grandpa Brimhall's huge collection of inspired writings for use by future generations. Indeed, their hearts have been turned to him, and his heart has surely turned to them and to all of his posterity. And that is the third evidence the continued existence of a great body of works, both written on sheets of paper and written in the hearts of many men and women of faith. For example, President Benson uh, wrote, No man has so inspired me with so few spoken words as has President Brimhall in his famous four-minute assembly talks. Can we catch a glimpse of the continuing impact President Brimhall is having just as he influenced President Benson, at least to some degree, and think of the influence he's having on the whole church now. Think of the influence of many others who likewise were influenced by President Brimhall. Let me give an example. He taught a missionary class once and wrote to some who were questioning the, whether they should continue it or not, we have 101 members in this class, about 40% of them, when they came here, had some bad habits, such as using tobacco, blaspheming, using intoxicants, visiting saloons, idleness, lack of ambition. In other words, using their own phraseology, they were toughs. To my great joy, I am able to report that there is not one in the class today, but what keeps the word of wisdom, has a desire to learn, has a reverence for the name of deity, has respect for the holy priesthood, and desires to do good to his fellow men. Such was the influence of President Brimhall. All of us can remember memorable examples of his ability to say much in a few words. The story is told many times, but we'll, I'll repeat it here, of when a report came to his office that someone had stolen a watch from one of the students. At the next assembly, he stood and explained that 
some student at Brigham Young University had stolen a watch and he wanted that watch returned and put on his desk. He says, how can anyone possibly have someone else's watch when with every tick of the clock it says thief, 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 thief. It is reported that the next morning not one but four watches were turned <laughs> into the <laughs> president's office. He had the ability of saying so much in so few words. Let me give just two quick examples. One of his, one of our, my favorite statements, he said, one of life's greatest calamities is the capacity to enjoy evil. Think of that for a moment. Then he talked about giving and growing. It is more blessed to give than to receive, said the master, because the growth in the direction of doing good is the highest kind of compensation. No eternal reward for being merciful can equal that of becoming more merciful. The increase of power to do right is the greatest pay for righteousness. Growth in goodness is increase of joy, and joy is the aim of existence. Now, as a final portion, some have raised questions about certain aspects of President Brimhall's life. For example, the situation with his first wife, the state of his health, his later life, his passing, and so forth. I simply want to state for the record that we need not worry about any of these questions. God used him, was pleased with his work here. God is using him even now and is pleased with his continued efforts for good over there. I know this with all my heart. I know it for sure. It is my firm testimony that any who continue to wonder or question or assume wrong in any of his actions will be frustrated. For as the Lord said to the prophet Joseph Smith, and they who do charge thee with transgression, their hope shall be blasted, their prospects shall melt away as the hoarfrost melteth before the burning rays of the rising sun. Listen to his firm testimony. He loved America, and he said, Being an American is, is important, but there is but, there is but one thing above that to me, and it is to face the angels and say, I know that my Redeemer liveth. I know that my God exists. I know that I have a Father who, when I cry to him, has comforted me. When I have gone before him in times of greatest success and said, My Father, my heart is a fountain of gratitude because thou didst make it possible for me to accomplish this. I know as well that he has responded to me in these words of exaltation as he has in the words of sorrow and distress. I know it. Close quote. He not only had faith in God, but he had great faith in God's leaders here. Once he said, the great scientific men stand up and say this and that is true, and sometimes I doubt, sometimes I question. But when an apostle or a prophet of the Lord testifies to me, then I know. He was, he, as all men, made mistakes. He, as all of us, needed to repent and be forgiven, which he did and which we must do. From his own words, let me read a parable that reflects his thinking on this vital point of repentance and forgiveness. Quote, Two men who had been friends from boyhood were neighbors. They borrowed from each other. They exchanged work. They were fast friends. Then came a time when one had something better than the other, not out of any desire to outshine his neighbor, but just through superiority of honest management. The other became envious and then covetous. He became a mental thief of what his neighbor had. He was going to have it no matter what. His plan for possession was put over, not by theft or force, but by graft. Years passed. The fraudulent neighbor repented. He recognized his wrong. He regretted it. He resolved for righteousness. He made restitution to the limit of his power. The defrauded neighbor forgave the offender and remembered it no more against him. It was an ideal forgiveness a forgiveness as complete as the repentance. On one occasion, an acquaintance of both of these men thought to ingratiate himself in the estimation of the magnanimous forgiver by relating the unfortunate circumstances of years gone by, saying, I remember how so-and-so swindled you. Oh, the other answered, he never did it. My neighbor so-and-so never did such a thing. 
a person living where he does and known by the same name did it, but this man of whom you speak is not that man. My neighbor of today is another person. Why, he has had many an opportunity to do what the man of years ago did, but he has passed these temptations by, and so I say, you are mistaken. He, my neighbor of today, did not do it. It hurts me to have you or anyone else even think of him as having done such. In the light of his complete repentance, reverence to the unfortunate incident has not enough truth in it to cast a rational shadow. That is what he believed, President Bramhall. That is what he practiced. That is what he received. Let me read two brief scriptures, one from the Book of Mormon. Oh, how great the holiness of our God, for he knoweth all things, and there is not anything save he knows it. And from the Doctrine and Covenants, Behold, he who has repented of his sins, the same is forgiven, and I, the Lord, remember them no more. Now let me pose an interesting question. Since God knows all things, there is nothing save he knows it. If he chooses to forget, to remember them no more, does that thing even exist? Is there a possibility that as the earth will roll up as a scroll and reveal a new heaven and an earth, that life may be similar, so that those things fully repented of actually cease to exist? He, as all of us, has changed. He has gone on as we all must. Whatever problems he had, it will truly be said, he never did it. It does not exist. Oh, may we follow the Lord's teachings and how well Grandpa Brimhall stated them. May we be forgiven as we take the Holy Spirit as our guide. May we, who are President Brimhall's descendants through blood or marriage, or who, who are his spiritual descendants through our association with this great Brigham Young University, go on and perfect our lives, our knowledge of the Lord, and keep fully his commandments so that when the day may come, when it, so the day may come, when it may be said of the things we have done wrong by him whom we all worship and who is our true friend and of whom I testify, he never did it. It does not exist. Enter thou good and faithful servant in purity into my presence. I feel that President Brimhall George Henry Bramhall has heard such words. What a heritage to strive for. May we live to hear them. I do humbly pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Elder Groberg. Will Sister Jenny Groberg and Brother Delbert Groberg join me for a special presentation? During the past year, I have had the opportunity to become acquainted with this <coughs> remarkable couple. I found two people who know, know how to get things done. As we visit the Brimhall building this afternoon and also the George H. Brimhall Gallery, you will see some evidence of their tenacity. We still have a few things to take care of, such as completing the conservation of the Lee Green Richards portrait of President Brimhall that will hang next to the select quotations as you enter the gallery. Let me assure you, though, Sister Groberg, this will be done. In behalf of the Brigham Young University and the College of Fine Arts and Communications, I would like to present a special award to each of you. First, Sister Groberg. I can get all of this out here and handle it properly. Let me read this certificate. <clears throat> Brigham Young University and the College of Fine Arts and Communications are pleased to acknowledge the devoted service and achievement of Jenny Holbrook Groberg. Through her dedicated research and scholarship, the teachings of President George H. Brimhall more clear for the benefit of all. April 4th, 1988, 
Jeffrey R. Holland, President, James A. Mason, Dean. Now, Elder Groberg. Sorry about that. Thank you. This certificate reads, Brigham Young University and the College of Fine Arts and Communications gratefully acknowledge the contributions of Delbert Valentine Groberg. His leadership and generosity have made possible the George H. Brimhall Gallery, a lasting tribute to the university's fourth president, signed Jeffrey R. Holland and James A. Mason. Now, uh, we would like to invite both of you to say a few words, if you will, please. That is a surprise, a shock. Thank you, thank you. As I look at all of you very beautiful George H. Brimhall family members, I'm recalling something that happened in our family about 50 years ago when our little four-year-old daughter <clears throat> was invited to say the family prayer, she said, Dear Heavenly Father, please bless Mommy and Daddy and everybody in this house. Please bless Grandpa and Grandma and everybody in Provo. Please bless Robert and Jane and Ruth and everybody in Manti. And, oh, Heavenly Father, please just bless everybody in America. And as I look at all of you, I really echo that prayer for myself and for Grandpa Brimhall. Please bless everybody in this room and every other precious, beloved Brimhall member, George H. Brimhall family member in America and elsewhere. And I can't help but wondering when I <coughs> say the word elsewhere. Grandpa and those of his family now living with him in the spirit world are rejoicing with us today. My husband and I recently placed in the beautiful Brimhall Gallery four copies of the ninth volume of his works for you to enjoy, to copy, to use. There will be a set also in the Harold B. Lee Library for you to check out. Also a set in the Church Historical Department. You know, preparing these volumes has been, and I'll read it, expensive, demanding, exhausting, overwhelming, agonizing. But I wish with all my heart every one of you could prepare every one of those volumes because doing so has also been enlightening enlarging, strengthening, fulfilling. It has brought unbelievable joy and blessings. May I mention just three blessings? My wonderful mother, <clears throat> John referred to, when she was 15 years old, was told by a patriarch that through her lineage, her father's works would be kept to bless others especially the youth of Israel, as, he, as Grandpa ministered in Israel. Mother's implicit confidence in this patriarch was proved by her faithfully collecting, and I just have to show you something here, his works for many years. And she actually, with the help of her wonderful sister, Jenny B. Knight, made it possible for us to have 45 volumes like this, many, many pages in her own handwriting, besides countless 
notebooks and folders and so on. This collection of mothers has been the chief source of these volumes now available, but there will be three or four more volumes still. Now, <clears throat> let me just uh, quickly mention how thrilled we are as a family to work together to get this material available. How grateful we are to help mother patriarchal blessing be fulfilled. The second blessing that I'll just quickly refer to. As we've read Grandpa Brimhall's works, and as others have, invariably we find we can't put them down. We just have to keep going on and on, reading more and more. You know why? Because as we read them, we discover they have ideas, truths, answers that we need right now, today. For example, my beautiful little daughter was looking at this book pre organized by two of my sisters, Helen Dahlquist and Beth Berry, who are here. And she opened it and started to read. And I'll just give you one or two thoughts. John has already quoted some beautiful ones. The Spirit of the Lord illuminates without consuming the spirit of the evil one consumes without illuminating. The companionship of the spirit of the Lord brings helpfulness with preparation, leadership with love. It is masterful as well as meek. It is service that springs from within, draws strength from above, and builds gratitude below. The service spoken of by the Savior when he taught to be master of all meant to be servant to all. A service as irresistible as a sunbeam and as certain of success as truth is of triumph. I'm just going to mention one other quick incident. I had a letter from a beautiful little high school graduate, our granddaughter. Grandma, she wrote, my friends want me to go with them to college but not to be by you. What shall I tell them? So I wrote her. Your great-great-grandfather said this about BYU. BYU is the greatest school on earth. Greatest as measured by its purpose to train for efficient service. The workers in a church that has for its purpose the enrichment of the lives of those who have gone before, those who are here now, and those who are yet to come. Blessing number three. You know, my husband and I and other helpers have tried to put these things together, all this great material. Once in a while, it's been just more than we feel like we've given her all. It wasn't quite enough. But at this point, on several occasions, very strange things have happened. I know some of you have had these experiences. You give all you can and it isn't quite enough and something happens. Just as if somebody on the other side of the veil is also interested and eager and really helping and is helping. In conclusion, uh, 1935, the George H. Brimhall was first dedicated the building. Aunt Fawn McKay and Aunt Jenny Knight were asked to speak. Aunt Jenny told Mother the night before she gave that talk, she went out to the Provo Cemetery and read that talk on her father's grave, and she felt that he was very pleased with it. So last night, my beloved companion and I went to the Provo Cemetery. We visited Aunt Jenny's grave and Mother's and Grandpa Brimhall's and we talked and then we prayed. We prayed that all of them, all of the other wonderful Brimhall's, all of you here today and especially our Heavenly Father and His beloved Son would be pleased with what has been accomplished. May this be so, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Thank you very much, uh, Dean Mason, for this presentation. It's uh, undeserved. Uh, many others have done so much. I feel a little bit like uh, uh, the story is told of the great uh, scientist who, near the end of his life, was given credit for Sir Isaac Newton was given credit for accomplishing almost everything that could be done. And he said, uh, I feel like a child on the beach. I found a stone here and there, but the whole ocean lies before me unexplored. There's so much more to do, but I'd like to just thank uh, President Holland, the administration, the dean of the college and the director of the uh, department of design and uh, the architects and those that have worked with them on this mammoth project which has been so beautifully done and then second i'd like to just say i came here to the byu 60 years ago i had been in washington dc just prior to that, and Senator Reed Smoot had arranged for me to meet uh, Calvin Coolidge, who was then President of the United States, and one of Coolidge's friends complimented him on a talk that he had given, and Calvin Coolidge replied, if I'd have been better prepared, I could have made it shorter. I came and met Jenny Holbrook, who was the acting secretary to her grandfather, who was the president emeritus, President Brimhall. We walked from room D into the college hall, and there George H. Brimhall gave a talk that I remember, I think, almost every word, and I said to Jenny, how can he say so much in such few words and such a short time? She said almost the same as Calvin Coolidge had said. He was well prepared. He could make it short. Then I'd like to just say that uh, the thought that he gave me, and uh, I think we have uh, profited by it in many ways, and that is be ready for the instant of opportunity. About three or four years ago, we started to uh, wondering about what was going to happen to the Brimhall building. And through inquiry and through uh, wanting to be helpful and having the members of the family helpful, we were able, and it was a great joy, to participate in what has happened there. Thank you all very much, and uh, I'm just so proud to be a part with you in what is what has happened just recently what happened in the beginning as a part of history and especially this whole ocean that lies before us unexplored thank you and god bless you Thank you, brother and sister Groberg. We'll be privileged to hear a vocal solo, I Love You, Utah Valley. Uh, this was a collaborated efforts of President Brim Hall and a former uh, member of our music faculty, William Hansen. And this will be sung by a granddaughter, and I, I don't know the name. Of the, so maybe if she could uh, introduce herself for us. Then Jeffrey R. Holland will be our uh, concluding, concluding speaker and he will be followed by a prayer, the benediction by L. Robert Anderson. Thank you. I guess I'm bound and determined to forget that trio. After President Holland speaks, we will have the trio, May I Know the Lord as Friend. And the, for those of you who do not know the campus, uh, we do have some maps here. Uh, showing you where the Brimhall building is, if there's anyone who doesn't know. 
And uh, let me again remind you to fill out the card before you go for the uh, photography session downstairs. I Love You, Utah Valley will be sung by Gloria Groberg Hubble with Ani Fritzen on the piano, and I'm her mother, Mary Jane. And <clears throat> we're descendants from, uh, we're children of Jenny and Delbert Groberg. Regarding the song, I Love You, Utah Valley, from a Provo newspaper nearly 60 years ago, 1929, we read, I know of no song that so completely sets forth the charms of Utah Valley as the one whose lyric was composed by Dr. George H. Brimhall, said a prominent man of this valley. If this man was right, then the song should become a folk song of the valley people. After this song was first published, President Brimhall felt he had neglected the people of the valley in his song. The two published verses were on the characteristics of Utah Valley as a place, so he wrote two more verses about the people. These last two verses never became part of the published song, but here they are. I love the noble people that dwell upon your soil. So lofty in their leisure and so happy in their toil. I love the goodwill feeling that moves the social air. I love the onward spirit that is met with everywhere. I love your growing army of happy girls and boys, the safety of our country, and the greatest of our joys. I love their onward progress, and I love to hear them sing the glory of our nation where the people are the king. like everyone that would like to to join in on the second chorus. I don't believe the words are printed in the program, but if you know it or can pick it up, I'd appreciate that. I love you, Utah Valley. You are near and dear to me. I
was a stunning performance. I, I, is it my age or my inexperience? But I didn't know that. I didn't know that song, and I'm delighted. And those little echoes, the little refrain from the college song, coming through there, make that a a particularly a sweet and touching message. What a nice way to conclude this wonderful, wonderful luncheon. My gosh, what a family. Uh, it's a good thing we only have you here every two or three weeks. Uh, <laughs> we're delighted. We're delighted to join with family uh, and friends, but largely family, of George H. Brimhall in this celebration today. It's a great honor for us as university administrators to claim kinship. Certainly, uh, I have a special affection for President Brimhall. He is one of the heroes in my life, uh, much more so uh, now that I've been able to think about some of the things he thought about. We were joking at the table with, with John and Jean and their parents that life doesn't change very much at the university. I'm still struggling with exactly the things George Brimhall struggled with uh, three quarters of a century ago. And I guess that's part of the joy and beauty of... Uh, of life generally and of life at Brigham Young University. And so this is a special moment for, for me and for Sister Holland and for our associates in the administration. And uh, on behalf of the university family, to the Brimhall family, we welcome you, we thank you, we rejoice in what this um, recommemoration, recelebration of the Brimhall name means for us. That's uh, sort of brought to a focal point today in and around this luncheon, but it will continue and it will be preserved because of your efforts in the, in the building and in the gallery that we celebrate and which now officially opens today. And Brother Seifert and others are already uh, organized uh, following this luncheon to make sure you get a good look at the, at the newly renovated building. We've been through it, obviously, as administrators. We're very proud of it. You'll see the gallery and many of the pieces of memorabilia and the kinds of things that Sister Groberg has referred to. And we just think it's a great day for for the BYU family, so we we thank uh, we thank the Brimhall uh, family for it. I'm confident that when uh, uh, George Brimhall graduated uh, from the academy, just a couple of years after it was started, 77, uh, I'm sure he did not think then uh, his reverence for Carl G. Mazur being what it was and and uh, all that happens in a young man's life. I'm sure he did not realize, didn't, probably didn't even entertain the thought, that later, not very much later, he would return as president of that same academy and university. And I'm sure that when President Brimhall himself pushed through what was then the old one-story mechanic arts building, I'm sure he did not realize that uh, that building would eventually bear his name which it now does with another couple of stories added to it. We're delighted that that one-story mechanic arts building first pursued in 1918 under President Brimhall, which did grow another couple of stories to total three, has now, 70 years later, become one of the landmarks of the university. The Brimhall building is legendary on this campus, and Sister Holland and I are particularly grateful uh, for the Brimhall family and for the Brimhall building and for President Brimhall because they and therefore you are our closest neighbors. Our, our children have kidded us a little bit about living in such an exclusive neighborhood. We can't find a neighbor for five miles uh, more or less uh, where we live in the, in, in the president's home and Pat and I have kidded them about that and we say well we have we have the most reputable neighbors in Utah County. We have uh, Carl G. Mazur's family just down on the point of the hill about uh, 50 yards away and we have Heber J. Grant and his family just across the quad and we have on the left the David O. McKay family and right outside our door we have George H. Brimhall. And uh, I don't know where you could go in all of Utah County to have a better neighborhood uh, than that and I'm not sure our children have been entirely satisfied but they've at least uh, they've at least tolerated the response. And, uh, and we do feel that way. We do feel that way about uh, the legendary figures whose names are on the buildings that circle uh, our home and give great meaning to the presidency of this university. And I'm grateful that uh, the president's home is located in just the position that it is, for we feel that strength, and it's part of that joy that we celebrate here 
uh, with you today. We're, we're indebted, as has already been noted, to, to Delbert and Jenny and to their family, but to many, many other members of the family. We want that understood and appreciated for the financial assistance that's allowed us to remodel and refurbish and enhance this monument, and it is that, uh, to President Brimhall, and a monument that's greatly used, dearly used. You'll see that today. There isn't a more used building on campus uh, than the Brimhall building, and that's as it should be in these days of uh, limited budgets and uh, restricted resources. We're going to take advantage of every capacity and uh, capability that we have, and uh, you'll see just exactly how, how well used uh, the Brimhall building is and how much more so, uh, as Brother Seifert and others will make clear, how much more so because of the renovation and the refurbishing that we've enjoyed. It is also obvious from the things that have been said, and I make no effort here to, to repeat the marvelous uh, tribute paid by a grandson, a great-grandson, uh, uh, from uh, John Groberg to his great-grandfather, but it's clear that, that the legacy from George Brimhall is not just in a building or in the physical uh, arrangements of the campus, uh, but it is that moral mark. It is a, an ethical and spiritual legacy that uh, President Brimhall has left us, and that not only in his writings, which we'll celebrate and always remember, but uh, in his posterity. And that's why a luncheon like this is so important to us. Uh, we'll be able to read the books and quote uh, the little short to powerful sermons and remember those, but uh, the, the real legacy, the living legacy, the eternal legacy is more in the lives of his sons and daughters and grandsons and daughters, and now down uh, to the third and fourth generation. That will last long after the bricks have crumbled on all of our buildings, and long after time has erased uh, some of the writings. Uh, but the lives that are led here in, uh, uh, in, in, in the generations that you will uh, also uh, raise up as a memorial to his name, that will go on forever, and uh, we salute you. President Brimhall's name was attached to the building that we will now go to see in 1935. That was after the two stories had been added to the original building uh, and after he had served as its president from 1904 to 1921. Actually, one of his students, Franklin S. Harris, was then the president when that decision was made to add the floors of the building and to put President Brimhall's name on it three years, actually, after President Brimhall had passed away. The Board of Trustees chose to honor President Brimhall then by naming that newly remodeled structure after him, and this is what they said of him at that rededication. I have never known one who has been truer to principle, who has been more faithful to duty, as he saw it, one who was more willing to put himself in the background and to follow the advice of his leaders than was President George H. Brimhall. That was from President Frank Harris. President Heber J. Grant, the president of the church at that dedication, said, I think George H. Brimhall came nearer to having the spirit and inspiration of Carl G. Mazur than any other man that I have seen associated with this school. He succeeded splendidly in fulfilling Brother Mazur's shoes, figuratively speaking, and had the same love of the gospel, the same absolute determination of willpower, never tiring, working early and late, and always ready to perform his duty to the very best of his ability. And he did it under the inspiration of the Spirit of the Lord. That from the president of the church at the time of that uh, structure's rededication and remodeling. It was during the Brimhall presidency, as many of you would know, that 17 acres of additional land on this, our upper campus, was purchased from Provo City. We would have been limited to a relatively small triangle over on the point of the hill had it not been for part of the foresight of uh, President Brimhall. Other buildings obviously were added uh, shortly thereafter. Graduate work was introduced. The first master's degree was conferred. And furthermore, the student body itself was organized as a student unit with a student project such as the Block Y on the mountain to the east of us uh, being pursued. President Brimhall was an extraordinary teacher and a popular speaker, as has already been noted. He had a great power and passion for these short uh, epigrammatic sermons. And his notebooks are filled with those gems. We'll be able to see and learn and remember some of those as a result of the new gallery that's open today. And there is, of course, great motivation simply in the example of the life of the man himself. It is no small thing to have been born in a log cabin and to have gone off to then an obscure, unknown, 
uh, futureless, seeming, uh, seemingly futureless uh, academy in Provo, Utah. And then from one's efforts to rise to become the president of that academy and to see it become a true university. And I'm confident, Sister Groberg, through the veil, that, that uh, President Brimhall is observing all of this and a lot more that we do here. And I want to keep on my toes to be able to give a proper accounting uh, of that uh, someday. That's no, that's no uh, a jest, actually. That's a, serious, uh, that's a serious matter with me. I trust that I'll have to someday pass by Carl G. Mazur and George H. Brimhall and uh, those who have preceded me in this office. And I think this would be a very, very special day for him, perhaps uh, none so special since his own days of administration on this campus. We are the great beneficiaries of a marvelous legacy created and given to us by George Brimhall, others like him, some less famous, but all heroic and faithful in their time, who gave their energy and their very lives uh, to the future of this educational institution. Please know how genuinely pleased Sister Holland and I are, and I'm confident I speak for President Balaf and President Anderson, President Stolten, all of our circle, faculty, staff, students, and administrators, for this chance to have you on campus to uh, celebrate uh, the man and the work and the building and the legacy, and uh, to once again show appreciation for one who paved the way for us today in the 1980s and as we proceed into the 21st century at a university that I believe too with all my heart, Sister Groberg, is the greatest university in all the world. That because of its heritage and its purpose not yet fully realized but uh, to which we're fully committed. And uh, I pledge my love and loyalty to the posterity of George H. H. Brimhall to continue that uh, tradition and I do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. While the other members of this trio come up, I would just like to say I think this song is a fitting benediction in song um, for this meeting. Great-grandpa Brimhall wrote the words. He entitled it, Oh, May I Know the Lord as Friend, and subtitled it, My Desire. Dr. Florence Jefferson Madsen, who was a member of the BYU faculty at the time, set the poem to music. She conducted it... Uh, had 300 voice singing mother chorus at general conference and it was sung many other times uh, at um, great grandpa's funeral it was also sung the madsons and the brimhalls enjoyed each other's company in the old provo fifth ward and um, the words are printed on the back of the program if you would like to follow along <laughs>
Our Father in heaven, we are so appreciative and grateful of that which we have witnessed and shared on this special occasion. We appreciate and express our thanks for all who have contributed in every way to this most uplifting and edifying occasion. And perhaps most of all, we appreciate uh, our feelings of the presence of, of uh, George H. Brimhall and the feelings that we have uh, which are impressed upon our hearts and written on our minds of his optimism and his hope and his faith. May we ever have these feelings in our lives and go forward to meet the challenge of, of the future. We ask humbly in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. <laughs>